This is Bishop Dale Bronner. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notifications. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Well, if you were to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 12, reading from the New Living Translation there, you'll find these words. A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And uh, then I want you to notice it from Ephesians chapter 6, just verse 10 in the Amplified. It says, in conclusion, be strong in the Lord or draw strength from him and be empowered through your union with him and in the power of his boundless might. And we're speaking today from the subject simply, strength through the storm. Strength through the storm. Strength through the storm. Um, it's not a question as to whether or not storms will happen. It's only about when will they happen. Uh, storms come and storms go. Storms will happen. Uh, there are different kinds of storms. Uh, some people deal with uh, health storms. There's a storm dealing with the sickness in, in their body. Uh, they deal with the storm of a failed relationship. They can deal with uh, financial storms and uh, storms with family relationships of mothers and daughters and fathers and sons. There, there are social justice storms of unfair systems. There are storms of having a lack of skills to be prepared for a marketplace that is rapidly changing. So there are various kinds of storms that can happen in your own life, and, and we have to be prepared for them. And this is why um, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus and reminding them to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might because we are dealing with something that's deeper than flesh and blood enemies. And you have to realize that oftentimes when people don't like you for no apparent reason, generally there's a spirit behind it. There'll be people that when they first meet you, they don't like you. And they don't know anything about you. You haven't even done anything to them. Have you ever picked up an attitude from somebody and they don't even know you? You don't know them and they just don't like you. And you haven't given them a reason not to like you. See, that's a spiritual thing of an unseen force that is working against you, and you cannot conquer those kinds of, of forces with natural carnal means. And that's why Paul is writing to let us know that not everything that you're battling is a battle that can be won with nuclear armament and drones that drop bombs. Uh, when you drop those kinds of uh, fights and you're using natural armaments, you're going to get more and more of that popping up from here and there and another place. That was a country that I was in in Indonesia, and uh, they had run an ad in the back of the newspaper for suicide bombers. They had 150,000 young people that said, I'll do it. And I want you to realize that when you're dealing with a situation like that, that's not just a natural kind of a thing where people are saying that I'll give my life to be able to kill 10 or 12 people at a time. 150,000 young people said I'll do it. It, it is interesting. It's, it's, it's so interesting. And when you're dealing with something like that, it's very difficult to stop people from harming you who don't mind dying in the process. And that's, it's, it's a time like that that you need to depend on spiritual forces. I, I can't tell you the number of times that I've had the testimonies of people that uh, somebody pulled a gun on them and pulled the trigger and it didn't fire. Where the weapon was formed, but it didn't prosper. I'm just here to tell you, the weapons of our warfare 
are not carnal. People that have sometimes been beaten unconscious and they should have died, but somehow the fist that was formed against them didn't prosper in killing the person. And so God has a way, he has a way of being able to protect his children. When you're dealing with uh, warfare that is beyond flesh and blood kind of things that you can see, and you'll wonder, what's wrong with her? What's her problem? What's his problem? Why are people attacking me? And it seems like I get, take two steps forward and then I go three steps back. And you cannot even figure out what's causing this. Has it ever dawned on you that the cause might be spiritual? I mean, if every place that you go, if you're finding some, some a mechanical failure, that stuff keeps breaking down in your, in your house and in your automobile and costing you money, maybe there's a spiritual devourer that's, that's happening and you need to use a spiritual methodology to deal with something that is spiritual that is manifesting in something that looks like a natural way. I mean, is, is, is that, could it be a spiritual thing that you keep drawing abusers into your life? And, and you're bleeding, and, and now you're drawing sharks, and they smell your blood in the water. And they're coming after you, and this is not a natural thing, and you can't see that you're bleeding, but there are other folks that can smell insecure people. Uh, you see, a bully knows a person with a timid spirit who has fear on the inside, inside of them. Every bully knows who to mess with and who not to mess with. So uh, it, it, there, there are some battles that we deal with in this life that you need supernatural help. And that's why the Paul, Apostle Paul is telling us, as he's writing to the church at Ephesus, and he's saying to them, the same message that he says to us, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Because there are some battles that willpower alone cannot help you through. Willpower cannot help you get out of addiction. Willpower will not help you to get out of, out of suicidal thoughts. Uh, there are certain things willpower can't just bring you out of, out of depression. You can't just will yourself out of it. You need to use supernatural power. And this is why the Bible says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the, in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And if you've got demonic things coming against you, satanic things working against you, you've got to be strong in the Lord. Strong in the Lord. Strong in the Lord. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So you have to be strong in the Lord to be able to do warfare in, in this dimension. And I want you to realize, strong people, whenever you find strong people in the world, they're not just born strong. They are strong because they've already gone through a struggle. They are strong because they didn't run away when they were tempted to run away, but they said, no, 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 we're going to talk about this. And they had to pray through situation, and they had to work through situation, and that's how they got strong, not by running, but by confronting and dealing with it head on and to say, oh, no, oh, no, 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 we made a covenant. We're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about this. We're going to work through this. And they began to then deal with the spirit of that thing, the spirit of it. You see, because here's the way the devil works. The devil comes and he whispers to the man, she's your problem. And that same demon whispers in the woman, he's your answer. And while she's looking at him, expecting him to be her answer, he's looking at her and said, that's my problem. <laughs> and then that same demon that incited each against the other now leaves the scene and makes you think that your mate is your enemy. The devil is the enemy. He's the enemy. He's the one that comes with a spirit of enmity between husband and wife father and son, mother and daughter. He works in relationship, neighbor against neighbor, friend against friend. He's the one that's trying to flip the script. But I came with some good news today that what the devil meant for evil. Plot twist, plot twist, plot twist. He's getting ready to turn it around for your good. I'm just telling you, he's going to flip the script and twist the plot and bring something good out of something that was demonic looking in your life. And my question to you today is, are you doing enough of what strengthens you? 
Are you doing enough of what strengthens you? There are different things that strengthen you. Exercise strengthens your muscles. Exercise strengthens your muscles. The Bible says that exercise profiteth little. It may profit little, but you need that little profit. <laughs> exercise strengthens your muscle. Nutrition strengthens your cells. And when you have healthy cells, you have healthy organs. You have healthy organs, you have healthy systems in your body. You have healthy systems, you have a healthy body. Money strengthens your buying power and your social currency. Practice strengthens your performance. You know, practice doesn't make perfect, practice makes better. Practice strengthens your performance. I don't care what it is. If it's baseball, football, if it's soccer, if it's an instrument, practice strengthens your performance. Whether it's acting, practice strengthens your performance. Reading strengthens your mind. Reading strengthens your mind. Reading strengthens your mind. Not watching television. Reading strengthens your mind. Fellowship strengthens your soul. Because in fellowship you get encouraged. That's why we want to get you in a life group so that you can get encouraged through the fellowship. Encouragement is the oxygen of the soul. You get that from being in, in fellowship with other people. Fellowship strengthens the soul. Prayer strengthens the spirit. Prayer strengthens the spirit. Please hear me when I say this. Your character will never grow stronger than your prayer life. Because prayer strengthens the spirit. Prayer strengthens your spirit. Challenges strengthen your faith. Challenges strengthen your faith. If you never had a problem, you never know God could solve them. You never know what faith in his word could do. Challenges strengthen your faith. Whenever your faith needs to be strengthened, God will send a challenge. And a team strengthens your dream. You need your dream strengthened? Build a team. A team strengthens your dream. Uh, 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 it's just a team. It strengthens your dream. I remember a number of years ago, I, I did a, a men's conference up in the Adirondack Mountains of New York, upstate New York. And uh, I didn't know it was springtime here in Atlanta. And uh, I went up there in the springtime and I got up there in the Adirondack Mountains. It snowed every day. <laughs> I didn't even have a jacket with me. And so I had to have one of the big guys. I, I said, you know, you got more subcutaneous tissue here than I do, let me, let me have that. So he gave me his jacket, I was freezing. And, uh, and it snowed every day, it snowed every day up on, on top of the mountain where we were. And on this group, this big group of, of, of men that had gathered there in the upstate New York, and uh, every day we'd get up and then I'd teach all day, but I, I had the biggest guy that I could find there with the strongest voice to get up and go through the whole camp, the whole facility, several floors. And I could hear him on the floor beneath down there with the scripture that I had given them, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. And, and, and just, I, and I just had him to just, just recite that. And he just said, be strong in the grace that was in Christ Jesus. Be strong. He just said that be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Just over and over. And I heard his mouth at 6 o'clock in the morning, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong. I heard him walk by my door. And it says, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Just going down the hall. Be strong. And that was the wake-up call. Everybody's alarm system. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong. Because I got a group of men up on top of a mountain who have been yielding to their flesh. And now we are speaking the word of God, speaking life and speaking strength. We woke them up. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, not in yourself, not in your willpower, not in the power of your confession. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. There's a grace that, that lies in Jesus for you to go through whatever that you need to go through. The grace, the grace of God is the divine enabling ability of God to be what God has called you to be and to do what God has called you to do. So he was just telling them, we reminded them every morning, every morning for days, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I wanted to remind them that when you're weak, there is a grace that is in Christ Jesus. There is a grace that is in Christ Jesus. Whatever challenge that you're dealing with, there's a grace that's in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Let the weak say, I am strong.
strong. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Not in your own ability, but be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. There's a grace that's in Jesus to help you to be who God called you to be. And when other people are not graced to do what God calls you to do, it, it, it freaks them out. They wonder, how in the world do you do that? Because I'm graced to do it. I'm graced to do it. If you don't have the grace, it'll drive you batty. I'm amazed at how women have this incredible grace to be able to multitask. Uh, it's just a euphemistic way of saying that they have attention deficit disorder. <laughs> but I've, I've been blown away at, at, at how a woman can be in the kitchen cooking dinner. She can be in the kitchen cooking dinner. She's got a load of clothes in the washing machine, a separate load in the dryer. She's on the telephone and watching TV at the same time. <laughs> this uncanny ability to be able to multitask. And then she's got children. Mama, mama, mom on top of all of that. But you ask a brother, it's like, I'm doing one thing. I'm doing what you told me to do. We got a one-track mind. We can't do but one thing at a time. I'll get to that when I finish this. And homegirl got something on the stove. She got something else in the oven. She's on the telephone. She got a load of clothes in the washer, another load in the dryer. She's watching television and minding a conversation on the telephone at the same time, telling, hush, baby, I'll be with you in just a minute. Just wait. You see mama on the phone. And they got all of this stuff that they are coordinating and it blows men's minds because we don't have that grace. Amen. There's a grace that God gives us to be what God has called us to be and to do what God has called us to do. Have you ever noticed somebody, you, you, you got a friend and, and, and you wonder, how in the world can she put up with him? I mean, I've got people, I was out with a couple and I, I pulled this mouth up. How can you live with her mouth? I'm like, I would be suicidal. But the key is, is that they have a grace for it. You see, when you get ready to marry somebody, Everybody has their peculiarities, their idiosyncrasies about them. You have to ask yourself the question, am I graced to be able to handle this person's uniqueness? Because everybody, I'll just call it uniqueness. Everybody has uniqueness. And, and the question is, am I graced to handle their uniqueness? Uh, if you're not graced, you wind up either with a homicide or divorce <laughs> if you don't have the grace. But the only reason that people can deal with things that would drive you batty is because they have the grace and you don't have that grace. But what you're grace for, they don't have your grace either to do what you do. And they wonder how in the world can you do that? It's because there is a grace that is in Christ Jesus. So don't be strong in yourself because we are fallible, limited human beings. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the divine ability to be what God has called you to be and to do what God has called you to do that is in Christ Jesus. So if that power, if that strength is in Jesus, the more that I'm plugged into him, I get strengthened. And that's why they that wait upon the Lord shall re renew that strength. It's not that I don't give out of strength, but I plug in. That's why he says, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, because I'm strengthening myself to be able to deal with this, because there are some people that you, you, you'll talk to and they drain your energy. There's sometimes you see a number coming across your phone or a text message, and you say, I don't have the strength to deal with this right now. I can't talk to them right now. I can't deal with this. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You got folks like that that you know, and you say, I not not right now I don't have the strength and you'll just be at stuff at work and somebody will call you in some screwball supervisor manager and you'll just be saying Lord give me strength please I need this job don't let me say anything stupid 
and get sent home today and ridden up today. Jesus, give me strength. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the, in the Lord. You have to say, hold me, hold me, Jesus. Hold me, Jesus. Hold me, Jesus. Oh, one dear woman, I, I, I burst out laughing when I heard her. She was standing there praying. She said, Lord, put your arms around my shoulder and your other arm around my mouth. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. May I just remind you that whatever you are and whoever you are and whatever you've attained, if you really be honest, is not because you're all of that. At the end of the day, what other people call greatness, we really feel very ordinary because there's a grace of God that is on us to do what we do. There is a grace of God that is on us to do what we do. The apostle Paul admitted, he says, I am what I am by the grace of God. He says, not because I'm so smart. He says, not because I'm so anointed. He said, it's not because, you know, uh, uh, I speak five different languages. It's not because I'm a scholar in, in the Jewish law. Now, Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Now notice what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. He says, but whatever I am now, it is all, it is all, not some of it, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me. Favor is grace, another word for grace. The other versions do say grace. Because I am what I am by the grace of God. He says, and not without results. He says, for I worked harder than any of the other apostles, yet it was not I, but God who was working through me by his grace. God was working through me by his grace. Whatever you've done, it really is by the grace of God. It's by the grace of God. It's by the grace of God. I'm so glad that Paul had an honest moment here. Paul didn't say that it's so great because I've, I've spent so much time in prayer and memorizing scripture. No, no, no. Paul says I am what I am because of, his, of God's special favor and grace on my life. He said, I am what I am by the grace of God. I am what I am by the grace of God. And if you ever rise to attain anything worth having, any level of notoriety, it's not because you were so disciplined and so diligent and so focused and had everything all together and all of your dots, uh, your I's dotted and your T's crossed, but it is by the grace of God. You are who you are by the grace of God. It was by the grace of God that you were able to raise your children without killing them. It was by God's grace, it was by God's grace, it was by God's grace that he helped you to get your children through school. It is by the grace of God. There are some things that God just had to help us. You were able to keep your house by the grace of God. You were able to keep your car by the grace of God. You better thank God that he didn't give you every disease with every dog that you laid down with. My God, by the grace, by the grace, by the grace of God, by the grace. My, you ought to say, Lord, I thank you for your grace. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. I am what I am by the grace of God. And my question to you is, will you find the grace necessary to handle the issues that life will bring your way? It's not a matter of whether life is going to bring you challenges and whether you'll have battles and storms. Oh, you will have battles, you will have storms, but will you have the, find the sufficiency of grace to be able to handle it? Uh, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8, the Bible there reminds us Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, here's the, here's the deal. Grace was there for everybody to find, but Noah was the only one that found it. I wonder if Noah was the only one who found it because he was the only one who looked for it. Because Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, Jesus says, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asks, findeth. And everyone who seeks. You know, it's, 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 it, there's, a, there's a process that goes here. There's a process. And he's just telling us, if you ask and if you seek and if you knock, it's, it's, the, it's the ask principle. Each one of them uh, depends on a different level of maturity in your life. Little babies can't work for that stuff, so they just ask with their cry. But when you get a certain age, you don't want your children asking you for money. You better seek a job. <laughs> See, that's maturity. Asking is one thing. 
Seeking is another. And the highest level is when you're knocking. When you're getting out there and beating down and knocking on doors of opportunity for your life, it's not going to come to you. You go after it. Don't wait for your ship to come in. You better go out and knock on some doors. You better go out and market yourself. Listen, if you don't believe in yourself, why should anybody else? You better say, I'm, listen, I'm knocking. Listen, I've got something that God has cooked up in my life, and I want to serve it to you. I want to be able to be a blessing to this organization. I've got something that I can add value here. And you've got to knock until those doors are opportunity, but each one demands a different level of maturity because anybody can ask others who are more mature seek their own way but then the really mature they actually get out and knock on doors that are closed because if it's not closed there's no reason to knock you knock on opportunities that God has for you he says knock and it shall be opened unto you and some people only have asking grace others have seeking grace others have knocking grace and you will never do anything great without knocking grace because when God brings you into greatness there are always barriers that say no and you have to be able to overcome the no salesmanship does not begin until the customer says no you didn't sell me on something that I needed and need, was intending to buy anyway it's when I said, no, I don't want that. That's when salesmanship begins. So it's about moving and developing and saying, God, have you given me a grace for that? See, I don't have the grace to be uh, a telemarketer because people tell you no and hang up on you too much. <laughs> and, and, and it gives you a complex about yourself to deal with that level of rejection. And, and I, I'm, I'm concerned about people when I'm dealing with telemarketers. And, uh, and you know that I'm not interested in what they're talking about, and so I just have to hang up the phone. Right. Just, just disconnect the call. But can you imagine on the other end, you have to have a grace. And there are some people that have a grace. They have a grace for that. There are men that, that, that use women as a sport. And they can come up to a woman with a, you know, with a line, you know, that you the butter for my biscuit. And they're telling her all kind of stuff. And some women will just keep right on walking. And then the brother, he's not dejected at all. He'll just pull it, just try the same line on her. Hey, you the butter for my biscuit. And it, uh, you the butter for my biscuit. He does, he does, it's just like water off a duck's back, the rejection, until the one who bats her eye and says, really, what kind of butter is it? <laughs> But see, there are other personalities that the moment that they're rejected, you know, that, see, the, I was, I'm one of those reserved kind of brothers who's an observer. And I'm going to wait to see some sign, some opening. Yeah, I, I'm not, I, you know, my words are too valuable for me to just waste on any and everything that comes by. <laughs> you know, I, I used to ride a motorcycle and... Uh, and, and while I'm, I'm out on my motorcycle, there, there were dogs on the journey that just, woo, woo. But you, you, you can't respond to every barking dog. So save your voice. Plant your seed strategically. Don't just scatter it everywhere. Plant with intentionality. Plant in a garden where you see the, the rose here. It's going to, the soil is fertile here. Don't just indiscriminately throw seeds everywhere. You waste too much of your seed. And if you follow the Holy Spirit, God will help you. Let, let me tell you this. A goal, here's a goal. A goal is a desired result. When you have a goal, that's a desired result. Here's a strategy. A strategy is a desired result plus a plan, plus a plan of action, a strategy. You need less goals and more strategies. A desired end plus an action plan, plus an action plan, plus an action plan. Don't have goals for the year, have an action plan for the day. It'll make a difference at the end of the year. Trust me. Trust me. 
Trust me, you need a strategy. Wars are won by strategy because God gives you a strategy, not a goal. And if you don't have a strategy with your goal, your goal will never be realized. You got to have a strategy. You got to have a strategy. You got to have a strategy. Strategy. When I first met my wife, you know, we met in high school. When I laid eyes on her for the very first time, she was lying at my feet. In retrospect, I realized that was a strategy. I had never seen her before. I see her for the first time. She's, she's lying at my feet. And, and so it makes me wonder. She was standing there with one of her friends. She's like, push me, Karen. Put, here he come. Push me now. <laughs> it is amazing. Before I ever met her, while I was, I was praying, I prayed as a 16-year-old. I said, God, I said, God, you know, I don't have the kind of personality to date every Mary, Sally, and Sue. And I got in my closet at 16 years old, and I said, Lord, you show me the woman that's going to be my wife. Amen. And I said, I'm not coming out until you do. And I stood on the word of the Lord in St. John chapter 16. And the Bible says, how be it he, the spirit of truth has come. He will lead you and guide you into all truth, and he will show you things to come. I said, Lord, you already know. And I said, now I want to know. And I'm not coming out of here until you give me a revelation. Amen. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and God brought that girl's face before me. So when she fell at my feet, I'd never seen her before in the flesh until she fell at my feet. And then all of a sudden I had deja vu. <laughs> and this is why you need to win some battles in the spirit. So when you see it in the natural, the word of the Lord comes and said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet. This is what I showed you in your closet. But it takes patience. It takes patience. You receive, you inherit the promises by faith and patience. Faith and patience. Faith and patience. And while you're in the waiting stage, you need grace to wait. Grace to wait. God has to grace you so that impatience will not destroy you. He has to give you patience, patience, patience. Most people get messed up between the promise and the delivery because they run out of patience. Because God has to grace you to wait. And this is why the Bible says if somebody's got real love, they'll wait. Love is patient and kind. It's not just patient, it's patient and kind. And listen, if you are not kind while you're waiting, you don't have patience. You have frustration. Love is patient and kind. It is patient and kind. Let me give you three things. Number one, sometimes strength is built through resistance. Through resistance. That's what happens in a gym. You build strength through resistance. Strength through resistance. You resist the weight, you build strength. You resist the weight, you build strength. And so when God gets ready to build your spiritual muscles, he has to bring some resistance against you because strength is built through resistance. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 4 puts it this way. In your struggle against sin, you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. He says you got to resist sin like you're, like you're bleeding until it hurts you until it costs you something, until you feel your muscles burn, until you feel the shake. You're not growing in the gym until you, you, you can't just grow in comfort. You can't just do it and say, oh, wait, wait, man, I, I'm starting to feel tight now, I'm going to quit. <laughs> no, 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 that's when, that's when your trainer says, give me 10 more. Amen. When, Amen. right after you reach exhaustion, then he said, give me 10 more. Amen. Come on, five more, and you're shaking Muscles are burning, but that's when you're growing, when you're tearing it down so you can let it then build back up. Strength is built through resistance. He says you got to resist sin that way, not just yield and cave into it, because when you cave into it, you become weaker to it. The more you resist it, the stronger that you become, the stronger that you become. Uh, you know, it takes a mother's strength to be able to wean her own child. And, uh, and to turn loose some things, it takes strength. You got to resist the urge to, to hold on, resist. That brings us to point number two here. Sometimes strength is built through release. Yeah. Built through release, through letting go. Some people think that they are strong or they hold on, but other people, you know, really, your strength is revealed by your ability to be able to let go. You got to let go of what has already passed. It takes strength. 
When somebody dies and you've gone through the grieving process to be able to let go, take strength. It takes strength. People that are still stuck in a place in the past, that's a sign of weakness. Strength says I was able to recover, to heal from that. I heal from the divorce. I heal from the breakup. I heal from the financial ruin that happened in my life. I heal from it. And now I'm ready to move on from that. I'm, I'm moving on from that chapter in my life. But there's strength that is built through release. Release, release. God called Abraham to let go what he loved. In Genesis chapter 22 and verse 2, God says, Then take your, your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain that I will show you. God says, I want you to release what you love. Release what you love. And strength is built. His faith was strengthened by what he was willing to give up. By what he was willing to give up. My question to you is, what is God asking you to trust him with and release from your life? What is God asking you to trust him with and release from your life? Now, something that God will say, I want you to give this up because you cannot go up until you give up. You got to be willing to give up some things. And when God gets ready to promote you, you got to give up your current level. If he's going to give you a new pair of shoes to start wearing, you got to take off the ones that you got on. You got to release them. And there are some people that can't be promoted because they won't release where they are. They won't release what they have in order to gain what God has for them. Here's the third thing is sometimes strength is built through remaining, through remaining, through sticking it out. And God will tell you, I don't want you to run from this. I want you to stay there and confront it. I want you to talk through it. I want you to pray through it. I want you to work through it. I want you to submit yourself to the process so that patience can have her perfect work in you. You see, the Apostle Paul reminding young Timothy to be committed to the process even when it is hard. And he told him in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3, he says, endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Endure suffering. Now listen, whenever the Bible tells you to endure suffering, it means that you're not going to get a quick deliverance out of that. It means that you're not, he's not going to answer that prayer where he's just going to make your enemy drop dead. He's going to make you go through it. And so sometimes when you pray, God will deliver you from the fiery furnace. Other times when you pray, God will make you fireproof. When God is calling you to endure something, he's making you fireproof. It means that you're not going to come out of the fire early. He's going to make you fireproof. He'll make that fire not burn you. When you come out, it will not damage your clothing or your hair. In other words, God will sustain you supernaturally through it. And when you come out on the other side, you won't look like what you've been through. You won't smell like what you've been through. People will look at you. You'll be telling that testimony and they'll say, girl, not you. Man, not you. I know you didn't go through this, but God will make it to where the fire that you were going through, the hell that you were going through, you don't look like what you've been through to be where you are and to have what you have. God has a divine way of being able to preserve you, but sometimes he'll say, I'm going to strengthen you by remaining because everybody that I know that's got a business has been tempted to quit it at some time when it got hard. They said, you know what? I don't need this headache, people stealing from me. I don't need tax issues. I don't need all of this unfaithful employees. I need to give this thing up. You've been tempted to quit on your dream. But God will say, stick it in there. Stick in there. Stick in there. Hang in there. Hang during the tough time. Hang during the lean time because times of bounty are coming. And if you can go during the season of barrenness, I'll let you enjoy a season of fruitfulness. If you will just come here while you don't have anything, and if you'll be faithful with a little bit, I will bless you to have your have more locations. You've got more money coming in, more streams of income. I declare to you in the name of Jesus, if God can trust you to be faithful when you don't have two nickels to rub together, God wants he blesses you then. I'm telling you, if he can trust you to praise him when you got just a little, he knows that I can trust this person with resources and opportunities and position and power, and he'll give you more than what you know what to do with. You'll have to hire people to help you to manage everything that you've got. I'm just here to declare to you that if you'll just hang on there and know, God, what in the world do I need to remain in so you can strengthen me and give me the grace to be what you've called me to be and to do what you've called me to do. But here's the great question here 
is the great question that we have that God is asking. When you're in a position and you're wondering, God, how do I do this? How, how do I do this? It'll be difficult at times. And you'll be asking God, God, give me some relief. I need some relief. The Apostle Paul, the only reason that Paul could say this to Timothy is because Paul has been through it himself. We see his story where he's been through it in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 through 12. Concerning this thing, he said, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. He was talking about his thorn in the flesh, this thing that was eating at him, this frustration that was in his life. He's saying, God, I prayed three times, take it away, take it away. And then God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches, in needs and persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul had been there himself. Strength is developed in the struggle. Strength is developed in the struggle. Strength is developed in the struggle. One of the worst things that you could ever do if you wanted to cripple a butterfly is to cut the butterfly out of the cocoon while it's going from the larvae of a caterpillar through the transformation. They have to break out using the strength of their own wings because it is the process of breaking out that then causes the veins to start spreading through their own wings and giving their wings strength so that when they come out, their own breaking out, if somebody cuts you out, they would be crippled. The butterfly could not fly. And I'm just telling you, there's some of you that are in a waiting position right now in your life. You're in a cocoon. You can barely move. You don't have many options. But that's not a place of permanence. It's a place of transformation. It's a place of metamorphosis. It's a place of where God is getting your attitude right. It is a place where you need grace to be able to, to be here because you don't have much wiggle room. But God's making something different out of you. And what God is doing while you're in your cocoon is he's causing you to sprout something that's going to give you a different mode of transportation. Because when you went into the cocoon, you had to crawl in. But when you come out... A butterfly will never crawl again. God has to shape your mindset. He has to shape your mind. And I just want you to realize that the whole cocoon is formed by what came out of a caterpillar's mouth. They spin the cocoon by what comes out of their mouth. You got to tell people I'm not going to always be crawling around in dirty stuff with you. I'm on my way somewhere. I'm getting ready to mount up with wings like an eagle. I'm not going to be crawling around in the dirt. I'm getting ready. And with the words of your mouth, you are creating the atmosphere in which your metamorphosis is going to take place. Your change, your transformation. You got to declare that thing. A thing declared shall be established. You got to speak it out of your mouth that I am graced by God. God is with me. God is keeping me. God is giving me strength in this. I am strong. He says, let the weak say, I am strong. He didn't say confess your weakness. He says, let the weak say, I am strong. God is in you. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. There is a divine strength that's on the inside of you. And it's designed to carry you to a place that you can't go by yourself. You have to go and walk with Jesus and you have to allow him to, to be able to sustain you in the midst of everything that's happening in your life. And the great question is, what area is God challenging you to have the faithfulness to stick it out? Yeah. What area, what area, what area, what area? And then you might wonder, asking yourself this question, how do I know whether you are to resist or to release 
or to remain? How do I know? Am I supposed to resist this? Am I supposed to let it go, release it? Am I supposed to stick it out and remain in this thing? What? How do I know what to do? May I tell you, you're going to need the discerning of the Holy Ghost. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, notice. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness. You'll be waiting on something other people telling you you're foolish for that. And cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. That capital S means the Holy Spirit. There are some things that are only discerned through the Holy Spirit. God didn't intend for you to be able to call a person. He didn't intend for you to get out of a textbook. It's going to be a divine thing. He might work it through a person, but they'll call you. And they'll open it up prophetically to you. Coming from a totally unsuspecting source that knew nothing about it in the natural and you'll know this is surely God it's like God I hear you I hear you talking to me Jesus I hear you read my mail I hear you Lord I hear you Lord and God will confirm that you need to remain God will confirm resist he'll confirm release let it go at that time you'll be in a difficult situation and then you'll pray after that thing and then for some reason, you'll know that God has not given you a release to just walk off, quit your job. He's not given you a release to walk out of the, the relationship, even though you know it is not ideal, but he hasn't given you a release to go yet. And you wonder, God, why am I stuck? Why did you assign me? I feel like I'm in prison. And I just tell you, God has a way of being able to change your situation the way it's as though he commutes your sentence. And it's a divine work of, of God. Nehemiah 8.10 gives us an understanding of how we are able to do this. He says, don't be dejected and sad, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Another version says it this way, is that the joy that you have is the evidence that you've got strength. Amen. The joy that you have yeah. is the evidence that you've got strength because you've got a situation that's not ideal and yet you still got joy. How, how could they still have joy how could they still smile knowing what they're going through how could they smile still dealing with cancer how could they smile the joy of the Lord is the evidence that you've got strength got strength in your life and that strength doesn't just come from from your money it's not a strength that comes from your physical prowess or your natural giftedness or your network of relationships or your academic degrees or your accomplishment. It doesn't even come by your great knowledge or wisdom. That's why Psalms 3, 5 tells us, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. He reminds us in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 7, don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. And 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 reminds us that for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. And we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. It is the spiritual victory that actually grants us victory. Spiritual victory, spiritual victory. Victory. There's a spiritual victory that God desires for you to have. And I'm just telling you, you have to walk in a strength that doesn't come from just having a strong family and a strong mama or strong daddy, because sometimes you don't have a strong family. Amen. And God had to give you a strong faith. Yeah. Whenever you have strong circumstances, you need a strong faith. Amen. You need strong courage. Yeah. You need a strong vision yeah. to be able to walk and say, God, I've got to do this. I don't have a choice. And you realize that I'm graced to do it. I'm graced. I've got a grace to do it. It means that God trusts you with trouble. Amen. You've got a grace. It reminds me of a poem that I, I learned in the sixth grade entitled Be Strong by Maltby Babcock. He says, be strong that we are not here to play, to dream, to drift. We have hard work to do and loads to lift. Shout not the struggle. Face it. Tis God's gift. Be strong. Say not the days are evil. Who's to blame? and fold the hands in acquiesce. Oh, shame, stand up, speak out, and bravely in God's name. Be strong, it matters not how deep entrenched the wrong, how hard the battle goes, the day how long. Faint not, fight on, for tomorrow comes the song. 
And my question to you is, have you found your song that helps you to endure your storm? There's a song of victory that God sings over his people. Amen. Have you found your song? Our ancestors never would have made it through slavery without a song. Amen. And sometimes the pain becomes so intense that words even become insufficient. Yeah. And you have to... Mm, Articulate with your word. And you have to just moan Amen. to God. He knows how to interpret Amen. the groanings that come out of our spirit. Amen. My question, have you found your song? God always gives us a song. The children of Israel had the song of Moses that he wrote when he delivered the people. Dr. Martin Luther King had a song, We Shall Overcome, that they would sing as the anthem of the civil rights movement. It had a song. Every agenda of God flows on the wings of a song. Have you found your, your song? Because it'll give you strength to be able to make it through your storm when injustice is coming down on you and you don't understand why it's so hard. Even in your pain, the, the help, help I, I know if, if thou withdraw thyself from, from me. remind you that there is a God that will give you a song that will take you through some of the toughest of times when you're in darkness and you don't know what in the world to do you'll have to reach out to God and say shine the storm that you've been in. 
He sees a battle that you've been dealing with. And I came to remind weak people who have souls have run out of oxygen to be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. You run out of your strength. He's not asking you to muster up the strength from the inside of you. You've already given out of your strength. You need divine, supernatural help sustained by the Spirit of God. You need His help. You need His strength. You need His grace to be who God has called you to be and to do what God has called you to do. Today is your day. Today is your day. Today is your day. It's your day. It's your day. It's your day. He loves you so much. And there's a grace. There's a grace that comes from God that will empower you to be able to do the words of Isaiah chapter 40, that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. The key is that they that wait upon the Lord, not they that wait on the contract. Not the one that wait on the man or made on the woman. Not the one that's waiting on the baby. Not the one that's waiting on the loan to be approved. Not the one that's waiting on the job. They that wait upon the Lord, upon the Lord. When you wait on human beings, when you wait on things, you get exhausted. You get frustrated. When you wait on people to change, you get filled with anxiety and frustration and anger. This is not about waiting on a human being. It's not waiting on situations to clear up. They that wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord. It reminds you of what happens in a restaurant. You go in the restaurant and while you wait, they are serving. And the message to you is to serve while you wait. Serve while you wait, serve while you wait. I cannot tell you, you'll be in trouble yourself. You'll need help yourself. But God says, I want you to serve while you wait. My friend Dodie Osteen was diagnosed with stage four liver cancer. She dribbled up and lost all of this weight until she was skin and bones at 89 pounds. Stage four liver cancer. They told her it was inoperable. They gave her no radiation. They gave her no chemotherapy. There was no operation available for her. They sent her home to die. She was in the bed waiting to die. And her husband said to her one day, if you believe that God has healed you, the bed is not a place for well people. He says, why don't you get up and go down to the hospital and pray for sick people? And I was with her a few years ago, and she just all of a sudden sitting beside me, she just began to weep. I said, Dodie, what's wrong? And she said, I was just sitting here reminiscing. 30 years ago, the doctors told me that they sent me home to die. She said, today is the 30th anniversary of my healing, where God supernaturally healed me. While she was out praying for other folks, she couldn't tell you when, but while she was out praying for other people, the Spirit of God was doing laser surgery on her. And he was serving notice to the demons in her body, to every malignant cell, to the mustaches. The, 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 the thing that had metastasized in her body, he was speaking death and serving an eviction notice to her stage four liver cancer. And it dried up and died and she doesn't know exactly when it happened. All that she knows is that she was healed as she went. While she was serving healing to others, God healed her. And when you forget about yourself, he said, God, I know that I'm in pain. I'm going through my own issues right now. But God, make me a blessing even while I'm trying to help somebody else. Make me a blessing. Make me a blessing. Let me pray for somebody else who needs prayer. And I need prayer myself. And he says, but I'm going to pray for somebody else. And she said, I'm going to pray for somebody else's healing while I need healing myself. And I declare to you in the name of Jesus that if you'll do for another person what you need to done, while you, you're doing that, you'll, you'll be surprised that God will take care of your needs. I never forget a number of years ago, my mother was, she left my baby brother at home sick. 
She was scheduled to speak and her mother's heart was battling and she says, God, I can't leave my child. My child is sick. And all of a sudden she heard the voice of the Lord say this to her. If you'll go and tell them about my son, I'll take care of yours. And mama went on and obeyed God when her heart was there with her baby. And as she was obeying God, when she got back home, her child was healed. I'm just here to tell you today, I'm not telling you something that I read in somebody else's book. I'm telling you about the realness of a God that I know. That when you wait upon the Lord, even though it's wearing you down, and you're wondering, God, should I try to stick this thing out? Should I just let it go? God, should I resist it? What in the world should I do? God will give you a divine instruction by the Holy Spirit. He'll begin to speak to your heart. And he'll lead you and he'll guide you. It is a promise of his word that I'll be with you. Amen. And I will lead you yeah. and I'll guide you. I want you to stretch your hand toward these folks that are here. We want to pray for them. Amen. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.